What's up, guys? This is Derek Kirby back again to break down my most recent piece. It's actually, I should say, my debut piece for The Smoking Cuban, that being an examination of one of the newest Mavericks, this one not acquired through free agency, but rather as part of the salary dump of Josh Richardson's trade to Boston. Dallas brought in Moses Brown, a seven foot two, 21 year old center, and uh, we need to talk about it. So I wanted to do an examination for the smoking Cuban. And now that I've done that, I'm adapting it here for you because I live to give you Mavericks content. It's just what I do. I can't help it. It can't, it can't be helped. It's a sickness. I'm very sick. Anyway, so Moses Brown, 21 years old, 7 foot 2, has a 9 foot 2 and a half inch standing reach. That's pretty significant. Why does that ring a bell? Tyson Chandler had similar measurables coming out in 2001. Just throw that out there first and foremost. Now, I'm not saying that Moses Brown is the next Tyson Chandler. I'm not saying he's a Tyson Chandler starter kit. I purely was making for Mavericks consciousness, Mavs fans consciousness, a comparison to give you a sense of his size and stature. Get it? Got it? Good. Okay. Now, why is Moses Brown noteworthy? We know he was an undrafted free agent out of UCLA after spending just one year there. We know that he was with the Oklahoma City Thunder last year, was part of the Kimball Walker trade, which incidentally has led now to a buyout of Kimball Walker from Oklahoma City, and he signed with the New York Knicks. Funny how that works. Now, Brown was able to burst onto the scene in Oklahoma City during a very, very much, no question about it, tanking season for the Thunder last year. This was an opportunity to spotlight some young talent, maybe see what parts they could build around in the future, but also see about guys they can kind of develop and kick up interest for, as was the case with Moses Brown, who I do believe the Thunder actually did like, but when they had an opportunity to move him and Al Horford to Boston in exchange for Kimball Walker and a couple first round picks, that became very tantalizing to the Thunder because we know Sam Presti takes draft picks, pops them in his mouth as if it's M&M's and he's on a binge. Like the dude just can't stop. Just everything you offer him draft picks. It's like a it's like a drug addict. I guess he will go for it. That's probably a bit insensitive, but we'll move on from that analogy anyway, because I don't know how much further to take it or if there is anywhere else to take it. So with Moses Brown playing in 43 games for the Thunder last year, he had respectable averages considering he was getting about 21 minutes a night, 8.6 points, 8.9 rebounds, 1.1 block. That's pretty nice, but what popped, what leaps off the screen is some of the games in particular, particularly, and I'm convinced this is why Boston wanted him in the Horford for Kimball Walker trade. He lit Boston up back in March of last year. I think March 27th was the game. He had 21 points and 23 rebounds. Good googly moogly, man. We don't see those numbers in the NBA anymore. The big man, the traditional big man, back to the basket, you know, nitty gritty down around the paint, nothing outside game, not stretching five out offense. We don't see that anymore. And that way, Moses Brown is a throwback of sorts. And he absolutely crushed in this game. Now, here are the highlights in this regard. Yes, he is a good rebounder, can be a great rebounder, in fact. At seven foot two with reasonable mobility, you would hope so. Could his motor improve? Yes. Could his focus and basketball IQ in general stand to improve? Yes, there's a reason he went undrafted, whether it was UCLA, whether it was his time in the G League with the Texas Legends or the Oklahoma City Blue or even on the Oklahoma City Thunder roster last year. He's had tendencies to vanish on the court, not just defensively, like just in general. You forget he's out there despite the guy's immense size. 
He has an okay low post game. He's not a guy that you're going to run your offense through by any means, but he is a guy who has some capable little jump hooks and things like that. When you have this kind of size, you can kind of impose your will a little bit. But frankly, for his 245-pound frame, he really should take more advantage of it. He needs to play with more aggression and physicality. And part of that is his upper body is not really built quite like you would like it to be. Now, because of his pretty good athleticism and his uh, his quickness and all of that that he has with a nine foot two standing reach. Is he able to at times be a great help defender around the rim, whether it's disrupting or outright swallowing shots whole? Absolutely. And not only that, he has good enough mobility that you can see a lot of times if you go, if you look at the video uh, on the article itself at the bottom, where it is the highlights of that 21 point 23 rebound game against Boston, you'll see situations and in other games where he had like 20 and 15 or 20 and 16, you'll see these situations where he swallows a shot on one end, just throws it back in the dude's face. It creates a broken play fast break the other way. And he's catching it for a transition dunk. That's nice. That's really nice. He also, because of his size and reach, is really good at keeping the ball alive, whether it's frankly kind of going over the back of the opposing player or whether it's reaching around and knocking the ball up into the air again where he can then get it up higher. He just has a knack for this kind of thing. It's really promising. Like the measurables of this guy are incredible. Where I worry is upstairs the focus the basketball iq because at times that that's troublesome i'm gonna tell you honestly he is an abysmal free throw shooter i mean we're talking like frequent air ball free throws 37 and a half percent last season he's not good in that regard no outside game to speak of his jump shot looks broken as all get out half the time his hand is swiping to the side instead of straight down towards the basket it's not good but you're not asking him to be that you're not bringing him in and saying like all right go figure out how to be Dirk or at least a Porzingis you're not saying that what you're saying is hey if you're out here we want energy which is where the motor comes into question we want disruption and frankly we want to see you be able to impose your will a little bit cleaning up the offensive glass and kind of in that regard. That's another thing that harkens to Tyson Tyson. You didn't run plays through Tyson. Tyson was pick and roll and Tyson was rebounding shot blocking. That was the main crux of what you expected with Tyson Chandler. And you can get a lot of those same things here in Moses Brown. Now, I don't think you're going to ever be able to play Moses Brown big minutes because I think conditioning is one of those things, too, that could stand to improve. But there is enough of the intangibles there that you look at it and you say, I don't have to squint too hard to see a really promising uh, talent here, a promising prospect, if you will. But at the same time, I don't want to get my hopes up, right? He is on an obscenely cheap deal. When he came into the league the rights to him were owned by the portland trail blazers again undrafted but he played with the texas legends then after that deal he wasn't retained by the blazers signed a two-way contract with the oklahoma city thunder he's got about 45 roughly games of g league under his belt and he has been a real presence in that regard but it's still one of those things where you kind of wonder can you consistently make that step like could you ever be a, a potentially routine everyday starting center i don't know i really don't but that would be really good if you could get that at this stage so because he was a two-way contract with the thunder he got shipped in june like just happened to the celtics and then to make the richardson deal work boston sent back a little bit as well uh, for Dallas in that regard, and you get a guy making just $1.7 million this year. Another thing, he's under contract for two more years. That's pretty good. Now, in two years, you have a team option for that. But even at the height of that contract, he's making like $2 million in a season, dude. Like, 
This is a very dirt cheap, intriguing prospect for a young center, which is something Dallas hasn't really had a whole lot of great centers post Tyson. We've tried every number of labels and all of that. We've moved KP there for a while. We've said, hey, Dwight Powell's that. We've had Willie Cauley Stein. We've had all these guys, but we haven't really found one where you're like, I could see you being a good centerpiece everybody's happy about for a while. And I'm not saying that Moses Brown is that guy either. I'm just saying I think he can be a good project where if he met that potential, maybe you could have a pretty frequent starter and get quality disruptive playmaking at your center position on particularly the defensive end, but also hustling, getting down the floor, moving in transition, and just straight dunking on fools. But he's got some things to work on. So that's a quick assessment of Moses Brown. If you haven't already, check out my article over at The Smoking Cuban, even though I literally just gave away pretty much my entire scouting report. Think, DDP, think! But even with that being the case, check out my work there. If you want to hear some Cowboys talk, check out my work over at Blogging the Boys as well with SB Nation. So that's it for my time here. Don't forget to drop a like on this video. Leave a comment below. Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!